What is up, my friend? What's going on, guys? Said Hendo here. Uh, you know, I promised you guys a video on this build that I'm doing. I'm not going to tell you exactly what all the parts are because I actually want to see who knows some of the parts that I'm using. Because what I found is that you guys, you know, you may be into to drone and drone racing and freestyling and all this stuff, but some of these parts really don't necessarily stand out to you and some of them don't necessarily look familiar to you and so therefore you don't really know what they do or where they come from or what they cost or any of that stuff so i'd like to see how many of you guys can tell me what's on my quad and you know where they come from and things like that i think that's kind of important i think it's a great exercise to see everybody else comment on what the parts are versus me putting it down low and uh on the description and you you being like oh don't know what that does don't know what that is so we're just going to talk about some of the stuff that i'm doing right now and i just want you to kind of like uh, check it over and see what you think i'm going to talk about some of my build processes and what i'm thinking when I build this darn thing. So check this so, out. Let's have a discussion about building drones. Okay, first of all, uh, the majority of the time when you see me build a drone, typically it's gonna be for racing. This is why, this is my mindset on why I do what I do and why I prefer to build something that I'm racing with. Mainly because to me it's more fun. Um, I get to build something that is fast. I like to go fast. Uh, I build something that is uh, tight and compact and versatile in many, many different ways. So I don't know if you've noticed, if you've seen some of my freestyle builds even. Actually, you probably haven't because I haven't broken them down and you know kind of showed you how I've done it. But um, even with some of my freestyle builds or all of my freestyle builds, they're built like they're meant for racing. And here's, here's the difference, I think. And I'm only, I'm only saying this based upon other builds that I've seen that are, say, freestyle or racing. And the reason why I build the way I build is because I see, well, I've gone through, you know, lots of different builds and I've, you know, changed my build style and all kinds of stuff. But that's part of it. But other parts of it is I've seen where other people have made mistakes or done some things that I didn't think made as much sense or was very useful or very practical. So I decided to go a different direction. Um, first of all, I build my drones to certain specifications. Those specifications are things that I've found that worked over time. One of those is when it comes to a racing drone, spe specifically a racing drone because like I said that's what I usually am building um, the thing is is with a racing drone you're probably gonna break an arm you're probably gonna destroy a motor those are what's hanging outside of the protected area basically let's talk about it like that and you know like say for instance um, I have a frame here you guys might recognize these arms you know they come off of a really popular frame but I'm not gonna tell you what it is I want y'all to talk about it and we'll all discuss it together. And I'll put, I'll put some comments in there when, if it's not going in the right direction, exactly what it is. But anyway, on something like this, look, it has a skinny arm. And when I say skinny, meaning that the width of the arm is such that it looks really, really narrow and it looks like it is not very sturdy. When we were, building drones back in the day some of them had much much wider arms now much wider arms mean more weight and it also means more drag okay so let's think about this for a second because uh, it seems like this argument about weight and about what's durable what's not durable this argument comes up a lot I've seen it on other forums and other chats and things like that and it's very very simple if you think about Anything that flies, I don't care what it is, the whole idea is to make it as light as possible. Now, different flying 
machines or whatever you want to call them have to have some girth to them sometimes. Say like in you know in the Air Force or or any of our, our armed forces who use things that fly, some of them carry heavy machinery from place to place. Well, you're not going to put, you know, a, a tank on a super light plane. It's just not going to work, right? So you need something that's a little bit heavier and girthy. But they still try to build that to a point where it's still light as possible, but still maintain strength. There's no different with our drones. We should all be thinking about that when we're building. How do I keep it light? How do I keep it strong? The other thing that obviously our armed forces aren't going to think about as much is how do you make it durable and crash worthy? They're not probably that worried about that as much because their stuff stays in the air. But with ours, we're flying them, so we're going to be crashing. We're going to be hitting things. How do you make that as durable as possible, but at the same time, keep it light, keep it swift and clean as possible through the air. And if you do break something on the main things that break the most, the arms, motors, things like that, how do you make it where it, that break doesn't destroy other things and also is easy to fix? Well, lots of manufacturers went to separate arms. As you can see, these are just two arms in one. This is not what you would typically call a race frame, although you probably could race with it. It's not the ideal, though. It's not ideal because you, if you break one arm, you got to replace both with this design. But this is more of a freestyle frame. You know how I know it's a freestyle frame? Because they call it a freestyle frame. And if they call it a freestyle frame, it's not up to you to redesignate what this frame does. Can you use it in other ways? Absolutely. If you bought and paid for it, if somebody gave it to you, it's up to you to use it however you want to, and you can call it whatever you want to. I'm not here to tell you what to do. But I will tell you that the manufacturing designer of this frame did not intend it to be for racing. Okay? They intended it for another purpose. Just like airplanes and other things that fly in the air have a purpose, so does these, do these frames and everything. So... With that all being said, when I'm building, those are the things that I'm thinking about. Those are the things that I'm putting into motion as easily as I possibly can. Here's the thing. That's not always easy to do. Uh, case in point is what I'm working on right now. I won't tell you what frame it is. I will show it to you, but I want you guys to talk about it. We're going to have a discussion about what parts I'm using and things like that. I will tell you the reason why I'm using some of these. Some of these uh, parts that I'm using are for test purposes. Some of them are to, um, to satisfy my curiosity of how well they work or how well they don't work. Um, some of them are for pure functionality purposes. Like, I, I'll be honest with you, I rarely use any other receiver other than the FreeSky. But are there other receivers out there that are great? Yes, absolutely. Are there other receivers out there that suit my needs necessarily as far as small, light, good connectivity, things like that? Probably, but I wouldn't know all of those. I only know some of them, okay? So I work with what I know. I work with what is light and small and a good compact package. With that being said, from the beginning, when I first started flying, all of these components were much larger. My flight controller was larger. ESCs were larger, cameras were larger, DTXs were larger, receivers were larger, everything was much larger. So finding space on these frames to mount in, a, in such a way that if something broke, it didn't have a chain reaction and break other things, that was much more difficult to do. Even though frames were larger, larger arms, larger main bodies and all that stuff, they were hard to find good, solid places to mount. People were taping, zip tying, uh, double stick taping, doing all kinds of things they could just to be able to hold the other, um, other components in place so they wouldn't be flopping around the frame and could be in a position where they're not going to get broken very easily. Problem is, that problem still is happening to this day. 
Now, you would think, well, everything's smaller now. Why do we have that issue of mounting things? Well, I'm not saying on every frame. Some situations, you still don't have the most critical things in place to make these things work properly. Case in point is what I'm working on. Here in a minute, you'll see why. Now, I know some of you are going to be like, oh, here goes Seth again. He's complaining about something. You know what? It's, it's not that I'm complaining. I'm pointing out something that not only affects me, it also affects you. Let's just be honest. No one called us up and say, hey, um, what are the first things that you think about if you were going to design a frame? And you know, the first things that I think about after all this time, it isn't how slick the design is. It isn't how aerodynamic it is. None of that is the first thing I think about. The first thing I think about is the components that I want to use and how to make them fit in such a way on the frame that they're protected, that they work well, that they don't have a bunch of interaction as far as radiated noise with one another. Yes, these components radiate noise. And when they radiate noise, it affects our gyros. And when it affects our gyros, we have less flight performance. No one ever talks about that out here on YouTube Everybody's silent about it. All these people know about this. A lot of people know about this. And mainly Flight One. They know more than anybody else. But I'm talking about other pilots who fly. They know that there's radiated noise coming from some of these components. And they clash with other components on our quads, mainly the gyro. And the gyro is very sensitive. It's not only sensitive to what's happening as the motors are spinning, they're sensitive before any of these things get to spinning or working at all. Noise on our quads or coming from any of our components on our quads creates problems for the gyro. So that's why we have filtration. That's why we have all this other stuff. Um, I really feel like someone like Bardwell, someone who's way more understanding of radiation and things like that more than I do, um, they should have a discussion about this. They should be talking about this. I shouldn't be the one telling you, hey, remember these things when you're building your drone because these noises will affect your gyro. Um, I know some of you remember when Flight One came out with one of their ESCs and, and then they inside the packaging, I know this because I bought several of them and then none of them work. I know this because I saw it in the packaging and I used it. They give you this thin piece of copper and you're supposed to, it has double stick tape on it and you're supposed to stick it to the FETs on your ESC. Well, why would you ever need to do that? Well, you need to do that because your FETs, the FETs that they use on their product, I don't know about anybody else's, I know that they're on their product, those FETs put off a lot of noise. That noise affects the gyro on their flight controller. Probably other, pe other flight controllers also, but on theirs, I know it does affect it. That means that if you do some of the things that they've talked about, which is flip your flight controller upside down or any of those things, you may be putting your gyro right in harm's way of radiated noise. Now, like I said, I am no scientist. I'm just telling you the things that I've witnessed and the things that I've had to deal with in my time of building drones. So therefore, I changed my build habits in order to try to alleviate a lot of those problems. Do you remember when we were soft mounting everything? There was a time when we didn't use standoffs or any of that stuff. We were trying to keep it so mushy and squishy so the flight controller didn't pick up all these vibrations but yet it continued to pick up vibrations you know why because it wasn't the vibrations that it was really picking up it was actually picking up radiated noise that was getting in the way somebody needs to put out a video that really talks about this and discusses it and talks about how that radiation it usually is in a bubble type of format coming off of some of these components how that affects your gyro and what you should do when building okay so this what this means is 
when a person like myself who loves to fly race quads, when I'm building, if I choose a frame that's really tight, doesn't have a whole lot of height, doesn't have a whole lot of length, doesn't have a whole lot of width, like everything is really, really tight, that makes it very difficult to put components in a position where they can't or have minimal radiated noise coming off of them affecting my gyro. I want this to fly smoothly. I want it to fly the very best it can. I'm trying to take those things in consideration. And the reason why I'm taking these things in consideration, I know I brought up Flight 1. They're not perfect. No one else out there is. But if I know how to use their components and put them in a certain position, maybe I can lessen the effects of noise that it has on their gyro. And maybe I won't be so disgruntled with their product like I usually am. I doubt that'll happen, but anyway. Um, so let's talk about what I'm building right now. I'm gonna show this to you guys. So here's where I'm at right now, all right? I'm all the way down to, and I do take a little while to build sometimes uh, when it's a new frame to me, when it's new situation, new components, new stuff like that. Some of these things you'll recognize, uh, Pro V3s, uh, F40, these happen to be, uh, let me show them to you. Well, you can't really see it. These are the 2400 kV uh, motors. I am using, uh, since you can see that, I'm gonna tell you, I am using an ESC that I probably, I've showed you guys on my Instagram. If you're, if you're not following me on Instagram or if my Instagram people aren't following me on YouTube, check me out on both of them, man. I, I put information on both of them all the time. So if you follow me on Instagram, you've probably seen what ESC I'm using. I'm not going to talk about that right now. What I am going to talk about is how I've set this up for a second. Okay, let's start with my motor screws. Um, some people think, uh, you know, this is preference. This is this is that. You're absolutely right. It is preference, but it isn't preference at the same time. These type of motor screws is what I like to use. Okay, these are the ones that come with most of the motors that are out there. I don't like these. I don't like how they sit proud like that. I just, it just doesn't look as clean, but they do their job. The point is making sure that this, this screw or this screw has the correct length. That's what's important because you don't want them sitting too proud of their position coming through the motor. You really don't want a screw coming all the way through and touching your windings underneath the motor. You don't want that to happen. You want them to come through as far as they possibly can without touching your windings. And the reason why you want to do that is because you want to get as much, since we're only using three screws per motor on this style frame, as you can see, um, we want those screws to come as far through as we can to that base. Some bases are thicker and some bases on these motors are thinner than others. Nevertheless, we want that screw to come all the way through and grab all of those threads. I would, su I will suggest to anyone use a medium Loctite on your screws when screwing in your motors. You want to make sure that they never vibrate or come undone or any of that stuff. That's the worst thing that can happen to you. Uh, while you're flying, you, you all of a sudden you see this shaking. I'm telling you this because I've done it before. Uh, all, all of a sudden something starts shaking and then all of a sudden your quad falls out of the sky and you're like, what the heck happened? You go look at it, your motor wires all twisted up. Guess what? Your motor screws came undone. You didn't put Loctite on them. Put Loctite on them. It's, not, it's, a, it's just a great insurance. Matter of fact, there's several things like your standoffs that you should also put uh, Loctite on to make sure as they're passing through that frame, they're Loctite it right into that standoff. All four of them. The top plate, uh, I'm, jury is out on that one for me. Yes, probably is a good idea to put them on there. Um, and then also, don't use just the bare minimum on screws as far as your uh, standoffs are concerned. Make sure that your screw comes through a quite a good bit. I My kind of rule of thumb is, if this is the length, you want to come through at least a, a quarter or maybe even a third of the length of your entire standoff. So my screw comes all the way up to here. 
okay? I do that for several reasons. First of all, these standoffs are aluminum. I want to get a good bite on those threads. I want my screw to come up into it and really grab hold of that post really well because this actually holds the arm. It sandwiches a couple of plates together. I, I don't want any of that to come apart um, at all. Like, it, I want it to come apart when I want it to come apart. There's very few times that I take the entire frame apart unless I've broken something really bad. So putting that Loctite on there is just cheap insurance. So I always do that. Also, some people have a, an issue, and I'm going to just touch on this real, real quick. Some people have an issue with using a harness for your, uh, from your connection, from your FC to your ESC. Let me kind of give you my spiel on this. First of all, that's like 8 to 10 wires that I don't have to solder. Secondly, they put it on there because they know that soldering to any of these components, as small as they are, if you put too much heat to any of them, some of them can be damaged just from the heat of a soldering iron. And you would think, well, why don't they build it to where you can solder to it? That's what people are going to do. You would think, think that, right? Trust me, they're not always thinking about that, all right? They're not designing in that way. It goes back to just like with these frames. They're not calling you or I up asking us what's the most important thing when designing this flight controller or this ESC or, or designing this frame or this motor. They may get some pieces from here and there. The best companies do ask. Or if they don't ask, they'll put something together, hand it to some pilots that they think could put, put it through its paces and find out if it's a good product and then get feedback. But at the end of the day, no one really asks us, how does this work best? Do you have an opinion? Because some of us don't have an opinion and they, they just think, well, they don't know or don't care when that's just not true. But anyway, let's move on. All I'm saying is, if you don't have to solder to these delicate components like the flight controller, uh, then don't. Uh, use the plug. Make it simple on yourself. I know you, some of you saw my little post on, on uh, Instagram and, and how I was talking about I just finished the harness and all this and that. I hate having to do that and move pins around and, you know, find these wire schematics and make sure everything is in. But at the end of the day, it actually makes things work a little bit better. Also, um, I, it tends to, most of these manufacturers are putting these pins uh, these plugs in a position where they don't get really touched because they're inside the frame. And so therefore, if something does uh, pull on the harness or something like that, it's really a, a kind of catastrophic type situation. So you shouldn't be breaking those very often. I haven't broken one in a long time, uh, so I'm not very concerned with them. Um, if you are concerned and you want to kind of give yourself a little bit of uh, insurance policy, you can put a little bit of something on there to hold uh, the uh, harness in place a little bit better. But I'll be honest with you, why don't you get a comp something that is already built in a certain way that you don't have to worry about those things. That's just my opinion. Take it or leave it. Now, um, there's some things that you really need soldered. And I said, you know, um, all of these wires, you know, your motor wires, your, your current, your all of these other wiring on here coming from your ESC to your flight controller to put those on a plug but there's some things that just don't need to be plugged in and the reason why I say that is because some of these things are very sensitive to controlling the quad namely your receiver so you want to make sure in my opinion that you, you go ahead and hardwire your receiver I feel like that's one way to ensure if you're a good solderer, and you should be if you're going to do this, you need to be really good at soldering. Let's just be honest. This is not an entry-level type of thing if you're building your own drones, okay? You really need to be good at these things. Being good at it doesn't mean that you have a steady hand, doesn't mean that you uh, just have the knowledge in head. Being good at it knows, uh, is saying that you know what type of solder to use, that you have a good soldering iron with the appropriate tip, with the appropriate temperature, with the appropriate everything, like a, like you know, having a little bit of uh, um, um, what am I thinking? Oh, sponge here to kind of knock off some of the little bits, and having you know, like some steel wool or something here to knock off the big bits to keep your tip nice and clean. So when you go to solder, you don't have 
uh, you're not uh, contaminating your 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 solder with with just you know stuff. Okay, little things like that mean a lot. I mean, you would think, ah, man, I'm just I'm only doing four wires. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can get away with it, but trust me, over the years, I found if you have the right tools, everything goes a lot simpler. Also, knowing that you can't put a ton of heat into these tiny little pads. Look at these pads. Look, look at how tiny those pads are. I mean, I'm going to use my X-Acto knife. Look at my X-Acto knife. is pretty, pretty sharp tip. Look how small that pad is. You should not be putting a lot of heat to those pads. If you're putting a lot of heat on those pads, you might end up with a problem. If they, if they reinforced it, if they made it good, great. If they didn't, you might lift a pad and then you're kind of screwed. Now, in this particular design, you got a lot of options, which is really kind of why I want to use it. I want to see what these options can do. But anyway, as you can tell, I have my receiver soldered up. I have my uh, ground, power, and then the third one is actually the um, S-Bus in, into the flight controller. And then the fourth one is my uh, smart port. So um, some of you probably don't concern yourself with telemetry and things like that. Let me let you in on a little bit of secret, okay? The more you know, the better when it comes to your drone. What's happening in the air, what's happening on the ground, all of that stuff. Battery information, uh, current information, things like that is relayed through your smart port if you're using FreeSky product, if you're using something else, I can't help you, you're on your own. But I want that information relayed back to my radio. Now, some of you might have uh, information in your goggles or whatever, but my thing is I'd rather have it on the connection that stays the most current and the most solid, which happens to be my radio connection. My radio connection is more important than even my video connection in a lot of ways. If I have uh, you know, a quad that doesn't have great radio connection and it flies away, then what good is my video? Okay, so radio connection is super, super important. So as you can tell, you know, I like to use FreeSky's smallest receiver with telemetry and try to get that solid. Now, some people don't twist their wiring together like this. It's not an absolute have to, but I see it as a way to keep things from being moving around and, and from kind of having a mess, okay? If you have your wires, and I don't twist that really tight because you don't want to go too tight with uh, twisting these wires because you can break the, the strands of wire on the inside. But twisting them together keeps, it almost keeps a nice little bundle going. Also, there is some, some um, thought that twisting wires like that create uh, a field where it, uh, noise isn't radiated into the wire also. Not as important on this, but radiated noise out is what we're mostly concerned with. So maybe that helps, maybe it doesn't. I know that with my builds, it keeps things nice and clean. I can move a whole bundle out of the way versus moving just a couple of wires here and there and having to shuffle things around. So I tend to keep all my wires in a small bundles if I can help it. Now, so let's talk about um, what's coming off the ESC. So with this particular ESC, it has, um, you know, obviously you have your power going into it, which is your main wire coming from your battery, okay? Well, it also has, on this particular one, obviously a built-in uh, back. So this back uh, will do five volts out. It'll also do full voltage out, but actually that's just passing through. Uh, then it has your four motor wires, then it has a current, and it also has, which is really, really cool, um, it has um, another wire for telemetry. So it'll tell you what's happening with the ESC. All cool stuff when it works. I don't know if this works yet. I'm hooking everything up to make sure that I'm allowing it to work so I can see my current draw, things like that, which is kind of cool because if this setup works really well, this setup is, this ESC, I should say, is actually, uh, it will use up to 6S. I have 4S motors on it right now, so I want to see how it works when I put 
six S motors on there too. So I'm going to be able to flip flop back and forth and I'll be able to see the amp draw of these motors. And I tend to use pretty much one brand of prop, which as y'all know, gym fan, baby. Y'all see that gym fan hat? I know y'all see it. Check that hat. See the monkey on there? Gym fan, baby. But uh, I'll get to test, test out some props see different amp draws and things like that. It's one of the things we, me and Ivan, we've been missing on our video. We want to give you guys some of that information, so I'm going to build this with that in mind also. So, what I wanted to get at, this, I'm going to show you the top plate of this particular frame. Let me see if I can hold it. Okay. Check that top plate. All right. Pretty small, right? Pretty small. I'm going to actually put it, let me put it on the back of this paper. This white paper, maybe that is even better. There you go. Okay, very small. I'm going to put it on the quad now. And I'm going to kind of show you how it's supposed to fit. All right. That's how it goes. All right. Y'all don't make fun. This is not my normal space that I build in, but this is the space I'm using right now. It's my kitchen counter or kitchen uh, island. And it's, you know... When I don't want to go up to my man cave, this is where I'm at. Just kind of tinkering around and doing some stuff. But anyway, as you can see, that top plate, there's not a lot of space, right? Not a lot of space on that top plate. So where am I to mount receiver and then also VTX? You see this? Look at that VTX. Y'all know what that is. I'm not going to even tell you what it is. You know what that V, who makes that VTX. So let's, let's, let's recap for a second. Oh, and that's the camera that I'm using. A real camera right there. It's a real camera. Mm -hmm. By the way, all these smaller cameras that we're using nowadays, they work fantastic. These cameras work great. All these small cameras work fantastic. There's no reason to use a larger camera nowadays. If you want to use one, that's fine. Larger cased camera. It's okay, whatever you want. But remember what I was talking about early on. When you're building anything that flies, you're trying to keep it as light as possible. Why well, have a large camera making things more heavy when I can use a small one that has the same video quality, if not better? Why use a large camera unless you already have it and your frame happens to fit it? Um, I just don't, I don't see the the common sense in that. Keep it light. Light is always better. And, and when it comes to flying, anything you're trying to keep in the air, obviously you're going to maintain uh, better flight performance because you're not lugging around a lot of weight. And your longevity of your flight might be better because you're not lugging around a lot of weight. Okay? But anyway, I'll get off of that. Uh, so I have a small camera. I have one of these smallest VTXs out there. I have the smallest receiver out there just about. But... Has anybody paid attention to the elephant in the room in this build? Okay. You know what? Before I get into that, let's talk about my spacing. Because I know that's, you know, some of y'all are probably wondering what I was talking about. So, all right. Here's the spacing. Now, it's going to be a little bit difficult for me to hold this camera and also this frame at the same time. Let me actually see if I can set this up a little bit differently. Okay, so hopefully you guys can see that. All right, so in here, this frame, the way it was designed, I, I'm able to put a battery strap in between here, no problem. So putting my battery on the bottom won't be an issue. Some frames don't have this space. Some frames make it where you actually have to put the battery strap underneath the ESC. So this is, you know, looking at this, this is the reason why I don't have a lot of space underneath my ESC because I don't need to put a battery strap underneath the ESC, which in turn, when you have to change a battery strap, if you have it too tight and you pull on it, you can knock a component off of the bottom of the ESC. So I'm glad I don't have to put a strap there. So I put it close, but not too darn close. Okay. Not too close. I do need, still need space for these components. I don't want to use up a, a bunch of extra room for no reason. So there's plenty of space for my knife to get underneath any of this stuff in here. I don't need to work on anything in there or solder anything, so I don't need a lot of space. Now, some of you might be like, well, why did you do your 
motor wiring this way. I only did my motor wiring like this is just so I can swap out these motors to another build if I want to and I'm still using as much uh, of the wire, keeping as much as wire I can, as I can. That's why I routed it like this. If I made, built this to be permanent, I probably would have routed these just a little bit different. But just to keep them out of the way because to be honest with you, these can be lifted if a branch or something got in there, but I'm not too worried about that, okay? So I just push them down like that. They're tucked away enough. That's good enough for this build because like I said, I may use these on a different build. Um, but check the spacing between my ESC and my flight controller. You see that spacing there? Look at, look at my screws. I use some pretty long screws and you see how I mounted this. This flight controller doesn't have gummies uh, on it. It wasn't intended to be mounted that way. So I mounted it solid like it should be mounted. I used, uh, these are steel screws that go all the way through. I do not use plastic. I don't use nylon to for my screw. The nut that goes on the screw is nylon, and that's fine. It's hold that down. I keep those, uh, I usually keep those uh, with a nice little dab of super glue right there. That's why I like it protruding through a little bit. But you know what? It'll probably stay in place no matter what anyway but I always check them. I always kind of visually check and make sure everything's good. It also tells me if things are balanced pretty good um, because I'll have the same amount of space on each one of these screws. As you can tell, this one back here is a little bit shy, but that screw, the manufacturer made the screw a little bit shy. Um, so it is completely balanced or as balanced as it possibly can be on this particular frame. Um, but I do have really good spacing between the ESC and the flight controller. Now the gyro is on top here, okay? This gyro is mounted on a piece of uh, foam and it, it can move. It has its own little board and it can move, okay? So that's their way to cushion the gyro to try to keep out vibrated noise, bent prop noise, uh, unbalanced motors, etc., etc. That's how they are trying to isolate the gyro from that noise. Now, for me, I uh, that means that I don't need to worry about anything else. I don't need to go overboard with doing anything else other than keeping things off of this board here. First of all, I don't want anything touching the flight controller at all, but I definitely don't want anything touching this board here that holds the gyro, okay? So, moving on. When I was talking about radiated noise and the reason why I have this air gap here, well, it's great for uh, for cooling to have some space in there. But what's also good is that the radiated noise that is on this thing, if the, the more space I keep between these components and I'm doing as much as I possibly can, uh, the, the more space I could, the less likelihood I have of any of this noise getting into my gyro. Okay. Now, I was telling you that... Uh, that noise is tends to kind of come off of it like a little bubble. Imagine if all of this entire board made noise, it usually comes off in a little bubble sphere type of, of uh, shape. That I don't know that to be f a fact, but that's what I've been told. But it doesn't mean just because this, just because this flight controller is over this ESC, it doesn't mean that the noise from the FETs on this ESC can't come around and affect the gyro, because it can. It can radiate it from around what's in front of it and still affect it. Not as easy or not as much, but it can do it. So you still want to try to maintain some space in here to try to lessen the radiated noise. Now, here's the other side of things. I was uh, kind of uh, starting to complain about something, uh, which is we make these small, small um, compact frames without any regard to space. No one asked me, I don't know who they asked, if this frame is technically good for racing because just because you made it small and light and you can fit uh, you know 30 by 30 or 20 by 20 on this thing doesn't mean 
that it's built properly. Now, what I plan on doing is I plan on double stick taping this receiver to the bottom of this plate, okay? Like that. Now, that puts it really extremely close to the gyro. There is radiated noise coming off of this. This is a receiver, so I'm sure there's noise coming off of it and coming into it for sure. Um, but that is the best that I can do with this particular design is double stick tape it and I'll probably wrap a zip tie around it too just to keep make sure that I'm not just depending on that tape to do it I will keep these wires off to the side kind of like so just to make sure that they're not touching that gyro and do it just like that and then I'll find some way to route my antennas up but I also have a camera and a VTX to mount okay so the camera goes here and these this isn't the final wiring for my camera this is off of a different build and uh, I have to rewire this um, but let me show you how it fits so you can see there's not a whole lot of space here okay first of all that uh, camera mount uh, sits in there just fine there's a little bit of wiggle to it but um, that's good it'll work but I also have this VTX with a with a um, pigtail coming off of it. So I was thinking that I would double stick tape it to the top plate and hover it right over my um, camera like this. Okay, so basically, let me get that plate and fell down in there. Basically, when I put this plate over the camera and everything, let me get those holes lined up. I should be able to get my ESC in there in such a way, hopefully, to where it's not touching the, the gyro, and I'll move all those wires, but yet double stick tape to the top plate. That is the absolute best I could come up with. Now, here's the problem that I'm having with this. Uh, I know for sure these VTXs radiate noise and that happens to be really extremely close to my gyro. I don't like that. So I already, already see an issue with this build. Um, like I said, I'm going to, all my wires are not cut to length and, and they're actually not uh, routed like they should be. But I, I see so many issues before I even get started with this thing. Uh, it, it, it's just, it's incredible. I'm like, who the hell designed this and why the hell are they designing anything? Um, you know, but yes, you have to kind of give up some things to, to make these small and tight. But the one thing I don't want to give up is flight performance. Um, I'm, they're trying to create performance with the skinny arms, with the lighter, build and you know try to minimize all the products on it but yet my flight performance is going to be compromised by the simple fact that everything is so tight that i'm going to be radiating noise into my gyro or things are so tight that maybe the wiring or maybe just nothing ever has its own designated space to mount to that makes sense i mean someone will tell you um after seeing this video you know, they can't build a drone to every specification of every product out there. And I say bullshit. I'm calling bullshit. When you say things like that, you're basically making excuses. Designers know how to design. They know how to do things. They just don't necessarily always pay attention to the things that we pay attention to. So basically what I'm saying is, if they don't know that the problem exists... They're not going to have, know how to design around it. And when it comes to components and building something that fits all components, well, it doesn't need to fit all components. Who said or who told you to try to fit the largest ESC or the lar largest VTX you can on this type of frame when it obviously is specifically for racing and for going fast? So why would you try to put the biggest components on it? If you're going to buy this frame, you need to buy it 
with certain things in mind, like, well, it's not going to fit a full-size camera. It's not going to fit some huge VTX, and it's definitely not going to fit a, a huge receiver VTX and camera. So you have to go into these builds with certain things in mind, which is what they did when they designed it. They, de built, they designed this and built it so it would fit small components. But even with small components, it is still very, very difficult, even for a person like me who has experience with all of this. And the one thing my experience tells me is this is going to be a problem. These components in this tight of a, tight of a space are going to be a problem. It doesn't lend itself to solving some of the major issues with these components as we see it nowadays. So what I'm saying to you is if I have a problem with it, that probably means you're going to have a problem with it too. So make sure you buy your components, buy your frames, buy all these things knowing that you need to put them on here in a certain way. They need to stay away from your gyro as much as possible. And you need to keep all those things in mind while you're building to make sure that you have the very best flying drone you possibly can. I know we all like good flying drones and we've picked up other people's drones and flown in and we're like, dang, why does it fly so well? It's not just their tune. Trust me, it's not just their tune, especially nowadays. It has to do with the way it's built also and the way they position their components and things like that. If you really think about a good freestyle frame, most freestyle frames are, tend to be kind of longer in the midsection. Well, guess what? When they're longer, that means more space. That means you can space out things in such a way that they don't interfere with uh, the com each other that on there. And then, therefore, you have a better flying quad. So... Think about that for a second. As much as we like to shrink things down, sometimes the better flying ones are the ones that have the space on them. And when I say better flying, I mean like they don't have any abnormal twitching or it doesn't have, you know, what you think is prop wash and it really is just noise and it just doesn't know how to handle not only the prop wash that, that it's seeing, but it doesn't know how to handle all the noise that's being radiated to it. So all of these, everything on here, becomes amplified because of noise, meaning interference from other components versus bent props, bad props, bent motor, whatever. It's trying to handle all these things. The flight control is trying to handle all these things at once, meaning the gyro, and that's just too much for it to handle. So if you can lessen your sloppy builds, your, your components inter interfering with one another, you're going to have a better flying drone. So with all that being said, this was just a little bit of insight on how I like to build, what I'm building for, what my mindset is while I'm building. Um, all these things should be something that you try to incorporate into your builds. Try to develop a, a nice rhythm to your build, a nice efficient way of building. Don't be sloppy. Don't cut corners. You'll enjoy your flying experience much, much more when you have something that's built to a certain standard and you never let that standard go unless you're raising that standard. So keep that in mind. Big said here to tell you how it's supposed to go. Uh, uh, make sure you guys continue to watch uh, my videos. I'm going to be putting out a few more here pretty soon. I got another giveaway coming. I'm giving away another, uh, probably another um, you know what? I'm gonna. I'm not gonna give away that frame again. I'm. A, I'm gonna give away a different frame this time. Something. Uh, something that uh, Adma Twenty perfected himself. So if you want an Adma Twenty frame, let me know. I'm gonna. I'll, I'll show you guys that frame in here in the, on the next video or so, and uh, we're gonna go from there. But peace out to all you guys, man. Later.